All right, everybody. Happy Tuesday, December 19th. And welcome to our monthly uh, jobs report and inflation update with Dr. Riley White of the University of New Mexico. Uh, my name is Albert Chen, and I'll be your co-host today with Colin Moe. And we're doing what we do every month here. We're talking about the state of the job market, inflation, and all the economic trends that surround it, and how it impacts your job search today, right? That's a really important topic for all of us, especially given everything that's happened in the last month from layoffs to uh, the Fed saying that it's finally going to lower interest rates, uh, all the way very much to our own pocketbooks and whether we can afford those coveted Christmas gifts that we've promised those loved ones in our life. And so to find the answer to all these questions, we've invited back Dr. Riley White. His bio is in the bright, bright link that you've seen to get here. Uh, you've known him in this community for a while. He's extremely qualified. He's the assistant uh, professor of finance and the, and the assistant dean of teaching at the University of New Mexico. Associate. And he can answer all of your questions. <laughs> Did I get that right, actually? Uh, associate professor and associate dean. I get to associate. Associate dean. professor and associate yeah. dean. Right. Okay. So he's <laughs> like assisting. He's associating. So I want to get that right every single time. And so we're here to answer those questions. And we're here to answer your questions as well. Because, you know, as I said, we live in a world where the economy is complicated. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's uh, crazy, crazy terms and everything. And we're here to make that simple. So without further ado, Dr. White, over to you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Colin. And thank you, Albert's List. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It is such a great joy, as always, to speak to the Albert's List crowd. Grateful to see some uh, familiar place, faces in this audience as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for our returning group. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about a number of factors. And as Aaron was pointing out, we got into a conversation early on um, about uh, when will the economy, you know, when we're going to see the uptick of the economy. And I'm looking for a few key factors here, but uh, we do have a window, a window of hope uh, that we're following forward across this pathway. So our hope is that uh, the economy will continue to improve or at least bottom out uh, in a short amount of time and then improve later, but a lot is yet to be decided. So let's take a look at some things and I'm gonna share my screen. As always, um, please let me know if you have any questions. You can put them right there in the in the box, in the chat window. Um, we can also do a formal Q&A or if you're worried about, I wanna identify you personally or anything, if you're worried about that, uh, you can send a, um, a, a question to me directly as a direct message and I'll do my best to answer that uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, sometimes I don't know, I don't know the answers to a great number of things, but I'll do my best to take at least a perspective of how economics and finance will look at this. And so it's a really interesting question. So welcome to our jobs report and outlook. Uh, each month I design a new, I, I ask AI to design a new cover. They really mangled this one. I had to take out, you know, AI does it still with the ability to generate images and, um, and not text is very amusing, but, uh, you know, I just look at this and I'm like, oh, this is nice. Everything appears familiar, but it's it's very weird when you look at it up close. But anyway, just like the economy, as it turns out. So next on our docket, we've got um, um, a little bit of talk about our jobs report. Then we'll go into some of the uh, inflation numbers. And then I have some specific questions that you all had asked uh, earlier in um, the week that Albert had sent me to address. And I will handle some of those as well. So let's break it down. We've got a jobs report. And let me tell you this, I was deeply concerned that after last month's jobs report, which wasn't very stellar, that we'd end up in a more negative trajectory, maybe even very close uh, uh, below the 100,000 new jobs number, which would be very slow. We ended up with about 199,000 jobs. That was good. And unemployment actually fell to 3.7%. Interestingly and amusingly, uh, this 3.7% drop was uh, primarily concentrated in teenage unemployment. Uh, other demographic groups remain more or less unchanged. So where have we been adding jobs? And there's good news in this and bad news in this. So the good news is, yeah, healthcare uh, added 77,000 jobs. They had a banner month last month at around 58,000. This is a lot of people going into healthcare um, across the board, not only because of the nature of our aging population, et cetera, but also uh, infrastructure, aggregate health concerns, all these things. There's a lot of energy and a lot of money in health. And so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of, a lot of energy flow that way. Um, we saw a bounce back in manufacturing. Uh, United Auto Workers strike. We saw a $35,000 35, worker drop last month. That since rebounded almost the same, about 28,000 plus, as the strike has been, um, in most cases, uh, resolved meaningfully. Retail trade. 
Retail trade dropped over 30,000. That is actually um, a particularly disappointing number because this is a holiday season period at a time when consumer spending is expected to be higher. And retail trade actually went down in value, which is crazy pants when you think about it, unless people were spending less or unless retail traders were indicating that um, or at least the retail trade industry or the retail industry uh, was was expecting less than than robust uh, uh, holiday expenditures. However, preliminary data suggests that holiday expenditures have been more or less in line to where we thought they'd be. And so this represents a very interesting number as we approach the holiday season. Normally, we like to see that retail trade number start taking off a bit. Um, we've also seen mainly um, a little bit of, of sad news in professional and business services. But in aggregate, the information sector, which has always been a punching bag in the last month um, and last year or so, has been um, on the improve. So that's a very nice thing to see. Leisure and hospitality coming back up. Um, as well as government employment, really uh, 49,000 government workers, almost where we were exactly last month. Uh, this is also a very good sign that the government hiring is continuing across government, state, federal, uh, and municipal institutions. Very, very interesting stuff. Do we know what jobs teens are taking? This is a great question. A lot of times teens typically look for those uh, potential uh, uh, lower paid service sector work in restaurants as well as retail. Uh, but with retail trade down, maybe this, in, this could, could indicate um, that we're approaching some of our leisure and hospitality workers, uh, some of our temporary workers for the holidays, um, and seeing unemployment drop at this time isn't abnormal. Uh, some interesting notes, interestingly as well, and also unemployment drops when less pe fewer people are looking for jobs, and that also may be the case. We have in November, we're in the middle of a um, of, uh, of of students engaged in scholarly activities, so they may also not actually be looking for jobs and be completely outside of the workforce, which would render them um, not counted. And so this is really interesting. So the hiring boom we're seeing is different to your question. And the retail trade is down in November. I'd be interested to see if the December numbers end up end up higher. Um, what's unusual too is we've seen a lot of pressure on um, retail institutions to start those holiday sales earlier and earlier. There's been a lot of news about uh, Black Friday sales being extended throughout a two or three week period or sometimes longer. Um, and some of that is, is happening in the November space where you would hypothetically need an uptick in employment. And so it also could mean that we could also look at this in aggregate as being, being maybe that uh, the retail sector hired a bit too much in the previous few months in anticipating the holiday season and then started cutting back in strategic ways. But it is something very interesting to watch out. Aaron says, I hope they wait until inflation numbers hold below two and a half. Then after three months of two and a half or less, start cuts of 25 bips every three months for the next three years. Aaron's talking about those federal, those discount rates. And we're going to get into that in a second, too, because we had some extraordinary news from the Federal Reserve happen in the last week, something that no one really was betting on, even though the markets were anticipating no one expected it would actually be said. Jerome Powell got up and said, hey, you know what? We could see three cuts happen potentially in the next year. And being the market, the markets being what it is, said, oh, my goodness, three rate cuts. Maybe that's six cuts. And so the market's actually anticipating six or seven cuts going forward. And to give you a sense of this, what does all this mean in aggregate? So the Federal Reserve is um, decides one interest rate, overnight lending to large banks that they call the discount rate. This has a bit of a domino effect on other rates across the system and also is um, an excellent place to start when the, when the Fed is looking at controlling um, or helping to control certain economic outcomes. When they raise the interest rate, that's a, that's a very convenient way in aggregate to increase the cost of doing business, increase the cost of investment. So if you have inflation, raising interest rates really effective uh, because what it does is it taps the flow of investment, stops more money from entering the system and sloshing around and helps reduce those inflationary numbers. You raise that discount rate too much, then we crash into a recession. Bum, ba -da, shenanigans, tomfoolery, and then the economy crashes because no one wants to invest in anything. If you lower interest rates, that incentive the economy. Deals that might happen or projects that might be a, a bad idea on high interest rates suddenly look good in low interest rates. And so there's more economic activity that happens. And so that happens when we lower interest rates. And so right now, the Fed is in a process where they've raised rates so much in an effort to reduce inflation. The Fed's acknowledging saying, hey, inflation's gone down a lot. Now we can start thinking about reducing those numbers. And that makes the market very excited because it increases those opportunities for growth expansion and a positive feedback loop to help the economy in the long run. However, some notes, we haven't, we haven't um, 
lowered the interest rates in our economy voluntarily in a non-recessionary environment since 1998. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's been a rare occasion for us to do so without a recession happening. Also, the yield curve, uh, which we'll talk about later, is, is also very inverted still. That means that short-term rates are still much higher than long-term rates. And when the Fed made this announcement, those mid-term rates, those 10-year and 20-year bond yields started doing like this. They started dropping in mass, making the yield curve even more inverted than it was before. And this suggests an uh, a recession. But what other evidence is there for a recession other than an inverted yield curve? Yield curve, And that's kind of where we're at right now. But there is a lot to watch out for, which is what we'll talk about. So this is very exciting times, unless you get a Fed put. The market roared. And, and as Albert points out, the market was incredibly excited about these comments. If the Fed said they might cut three times, maybe they mean 10 times. Lower interest rates mean more capital throwing. And, and here's the other thing. When interest rates are low for a very long period of time, that incentivizes people to take money out of things like bonds and put them into things like stocks. And so it makes markets very excited because markets help return higher yields. Private equity gets excited because private equity returns higher yields. And a whole bunch of people get excited because uh, of the prospect of higher yields. And in addition, because the Fed was saying long-term long rates will drop, long-term rates dropped, which meant the 10-year, which follows the mortgage rate, also dropped as well. So is it time for happy home buying? Not quite yet, Albert, but we're getting in a more positive direction. And all of that is very exciting. But let's think about this, and this is what happened this week, and we'll figure out what this means or what's going to happen with this. Aaron says, if the Fed cuts the yield curve inversion, is going to crush all the bond traders who have a yield curve bet. You're not wrong, and this is really interesting. Um, their duration risk will blow up. That should be another pile of mini SVBs, Silicon Valley Bank. So what Aaron is saying, this is a really good point too. So one of the things we watch for and we watch for yield curves, and I know we got really into the rates. I'm looking at jobs, but we're talking about rates. But the interesting part about rates is duration is a really interesting part of a bond portfolio. And think of it this way. If you have uh, uh, bonds that have very long dated um, values on them, let's say you're holding a 10-year bond uh, that you bought that's paying, you know, let's make up numbers, 5% on a 10-year bond. Um, and what that is, is a promise that in exchange for buying that bond and being that banker and investing in that bond, that company or government pays you 5% of the par value every single year. And that's a nice stream of income. Um, but bonds reward you in two ways. One is the price can go up and down, and then they also have these coupon payments that they pay you in terms of those things. And that's why the bond debt market is such a big thing. And if you got a 401k, you own, you own bonds somewhere in the system, probably a lot of bonds or a piece of a lot of bonds in the system. So, so when bonds are very interesting, because let's say you're holding on to a, a 5% 10-year bond. And what's interesting is as rates drop, as those rates drop, what happens is the price of that bond, um, if the rates drop to 3%, uh, the market, you're holding on to this 5% fixed income bond element. Because you're paying 5% on something that should be paying you 3%, that price is going to go up. You're going to have a uh, more higher value bond suddenly, and the value of that bond will increase. But to the point that we was, was just made, I had a group of students uh, present for our student-run portfolio here, and they were making a bet that duration risk, they could go longer on duration risk before the Fed's announcement. And we had a bond trader in the audience, and he's like, no, 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 rates are going to stay long forever, and I think rates could even go up further. And he was talking them back to a lower duration. And as it turned out, if the, you know, and this ended up being the issue here, um, ended up being that the student's motion didn't pass and nor did the bond trader's motion pass. But uh, the interesting part is if you had gone for a shorter term duration or, um, you know, got out of this, you'd be in a disadvantaged position uh, because right now those long term bonds that you bought a while ago before the, they started dropping in value are going to be paying higher rates and the price will be higher. Um, there is a risk, though, and duration risk can happen in some some other ways. Um, if you're holding um, um, bonds with with very low interest rates and the Fed raises rates, um, suddenly you're you're on the bag. It can go the other way. You're holding bonds that are giving you one percent and they should give you five percent. That means the price is going to drop and they'll be um, and 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 that's a risk that you have to adopt. And a lot of banks were in that situation. Banks, especially in the Silicon Valley bank scenario, they were in a scenario that uh, where they invested in all these treasuries that had really low interest rates. 
Um, and as treasuries increased in, in the rates that they uh, were offering, the prices for these low interest rate treasuries crashed. And so a lot of banks were holding unrecognized losses on the value of these bonds. And so it's very interesting. So Aaron brings up a really, really interesting point here because duration risk is a big deal. And there's a whole bunch of traders out there to Aaron's point, that are betting the opposite direction. That'll be uh, potentially um, worried about this duration risk coming forward. That's really good. Dr. Wright, if you're interested in any thoughts on the latest BTC Bitcoin run, I've got a bit of Bitcoin myself. Is my um, is my is my uh, 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 I like to speculate on various assets. That's my caveat. But um, and it's been a nice it's been a nice run because I put a little bit of money in it and it's been up since then. Um, but we'll talk about that too. Bitcoin um, operates. I've got a few papers out there on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and the operate is almost a um, contra asset at times. But we'll explain what that means in, um, in a little bit of time. That's great. I love it. I love it. Look at this stuff too. Aaron says too, and this is really good points. When rates start coming down 20 or 50 basis points, the 15 year mortgage rates will fall under five. Home sales will explode in summer, pent up housing sales through a million homes. That's true. There is a lot of pent up demand. But the interesting part is because the inventory rates have been so low, we haven't seen price adjustments that are favorable to the actual supply of houses. So right now, um, we should have seen greater asset price fluctuations. I'll be interested to see how asset prices respond to these values, Aaron, as well. Even though you're looking at higher demand, you'll be also looking at potentially greater numbers of folks offering inventory for sale. If inventory remains low, that means that prices will remain, unfortunately, incredibly high, making it a tough time for first-time home buyers. All right, labor force participation rate, 62.8%. That is more or less stable. Uh, uh, as we've seen, this is about as good as it gets. Uh, wage growth is continuing to ease, but there's a hopeful part about wage growth. Wage growth is increasing at about an annualized 4.0%. Uh, to give you a sense of this, why do we focus on wage growth? Wage growth is interesting for two reasons. One, it is the power of long-term growth, but it's also the power of long-term inflation. So if wage growth can continually beat the inflation expectations, or at least in aggregate over a year, um, beat uh, our current inflation levels, that does suggest that um, the economy in general, people are generally um, uh, uh, becoming wealthier, which should result in improved conditions for consumers going forward in so much that this um, in so much that this can continue. And so that's something to watch out for. So I like wage growth as a power, especially that it's it's ahead of inflation. And um, in theory, at least, that should enable people to start be catching up on, on their bills and expenses. But there's a few variables here that are of note that we have to talk about first. One of them is, let's look at this question. So let's look at job openings in general right now. We know the economy is getting uh, less, uh, less, Less, not less strong, but the growth rate is slowing, but that's still okay because it's still growing. So what does that mean? So job openings after the uh, COVID pandemic shot through the roof to the highest levels we've seen. Indeed, they've been dropping pretty steadily. The number of openings have fallen drastically, but uh, there are still more job openings than there are unemployed people. That is a positive sign. But the trajectory of it is downward. It is a uh, insane trajectory, though, because we were looking at this, we're basing this on a COVID-19 economy, which was itself very unique. So there's a lot of distortions here. Next, when we think about things, how are people feeling in the job market? So hires, quits, and layoffs in general. So right now, the quit rate, which is that middle kind of dark blue bar here, is often uh, recognized as sort of a symbolic uh, job confidence meter. How confident are you that you can quit your job? And as much as you, you, know, you take your cigar out and you say, tough schnoogies, boss, I'm headed for the hills and I'm going to go find some other job to pay me. Um, the quit rates themselves, as tempting as that is, many workers can't do so. After the pandemic, we saw vast distortions across the economy. Uh, certain labor force um, wage growth was, was very high in places like leisure and hospitality. A lot of people changed jobs in these areas. A lot of people quit jobs in those areas. The quit weight rose. And since then, it's fallen back down to kind of where we were uh, right around the good economy days pre-pandemic. Another thing as well, hires in general also have come down from their post-pandemic peak now down to what we call pretty good times overall. Watch the trajectory of these numbers. And this is the interesting thing. Are these values gonna continue a downward slide? 
then that would be alarming. Are they going to stabilize at a fairly good economic state? Because if it remained where it is right now, it looks favorable based on past conditions. And layoffs in general, while focused on a few industries, particularly in the Bay Area, that you've seen a lot of news about from various tech layoffs to large corporate layoffs, in aggregate, they're still relatively low. And that's very, very tempting to see. And that shows in a lot of the unemployment data. Even when uh, we have headline news about certain um, layoffs, in aggregate, they're still not catastrophically bad. Um, this is really interesting. So Aaron's also got some links too. As bad as this for first-time buyers, two out of four buyers are not first-time home buyers. That's also true. Uh, I like that. As bad it is, it is. Uh, you know... <laughs> if you're an independent billionaire, it's a wonderful time to buy a home. Yes, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. That's good. I appreciate it. But Aaron's right, of course. So let's think about this. So let's go down here. Real disposable income and consumption. So this was actually a very interesting discussion. This is from Pictet, uh, Pictet Asset Management um, and some data from Refinitiv and CISC. CEIC, I'm sorry. So one thing is, and so we have to look at this, and, and this has been talked about a lot in different respect in different ways, and people have, and economists all over the country have, have used and abused this graph to no end and different versions of this graph. But I guess my big point is this. And so one, one source of concern is that we had, of course, an aggregate amount of access savings that we agree happened after the pandemic. Um, people uh, who were able to maintain their jobs and not be laid off were able to certainly save a lot more money than they were previously. Some of that is due to a lot of the transfers happening across the board for things like $5 trillion of stimulus spending and the way it found its way into the businesses and thence the pockets of individuals. And we saw a lot of access cumulative savings that happened in 2021. Since that time, we've been on this relatively precipitous usage of those savings. I think in part it is true that this access savings has been a powerhouse for our consumer sector, which again drives two thirds of the GDP in general. Uh, so because people had access saving, they spent a little bit more money. And if they were spending more money than even what they had, that saving starts to diminish. And what we're seeing is the access saving in aggregate to the tune of about 1.4 trillion um, have, since basically, um, have since basically diminished. And we expect sometime by spring, the excess savings should more or less disappear. Now, access savings are interesting values because it depends what is an excess saving. It depends on what your benchmark is. And this benchmark is right at the beginning of 2020, right at the uh, right uh, before the pandemic. It doesn't spell disaster for the economy, but it does suggest we should be a little bit more cautious when engaging how consumers will behave in the next few months. And so U.S. real disposable income and consumption. So one of these things is really interesting. Um, so real disposable income and consumption, we saw disposable income increase drastically and then drop, of course, um, and then real personal consumption still remains ahead of disposable income. And we have, we ran a straight line across the board, always a dangerous thing to do, but we love drawing lines and economics, if anything else, a pre-pandemic six-year trend shows that while real disposable income is below the trend line, making people feel a little bit poorer than they have, people are spending above the trend line. And the question is, can we maintain that in the next year or two? And that's harder to argue. And it seems logical from this chart that the difference between the gray line and the brown line, at least in this respect, has been that, that swath of, of, of uh, access savings uh, that people have. And so people are spending that money once it happens. So when the money runs out, what's going to happen, basically? Credit card debt's already at an all-time high. And this is interesting. So there's a few data points on this. Some are hopeful and some are less hopeful. Is it true that the numerical value of credit card debt is an all-time high? Yes. We have over a trillion dollars of credit card debt, a trillion and a half of automotive loans. And then we got student loans out there cooking with Crisco, may, all those kinds of monies uh, that people are putting in or not putting in, depending on circumstances. In this situation, what you have with credit card debt at an all-time high, revolving loan balances, though, aren't particularly high in aggregate. When we look at the total household debt as a percentage of income, it's not as bad as it seems. And I'll give you a sense of this. So one of the ways, one of the big component parts of household debt is the mortgage. And because most households, to Aaron's point, who own a home or have fairly low mortgage rates or have owned it for some time, that doesn't put a lot of pressure on those balances on a month to month basis. However, it is decreasing. It is an art where it's deteriorating in its value. And it's interesting to see how this will play out. You know, if there is going to be more churn in the real estate market, 
Like I expect mortgage rates to continue to go down, I hope. But my hope is that a 5% mortgage isn't a 2.5% mortgage. And if asset prices don't drop along with them, and there is indeed more churn, a lot of people offering their houses for sale, and then a lot more people buying them, you're going to see that proportion of people who own above 3%, above 4% mortgages increase. And that does involve retooling your expectations for household expenditures. And the groundwork of what the economy is going to do in the next three or five years is going to happen in the next year. How people behave, how the markets behave, how people look at, at, at real estate. So it is a concern. And one of my concerns for saying that we're not out of the woods yet is looking at the consumer sector and looking at how things have somewhat deteriorated in some categories. Another thing to be interested about, this is really interesting, and I gave this up. <clears throat> I was at a um, City of Santa Fe City Council meeting, and I get to do my spiel up there, and I, I gave this slide up to them about you know other things that were happening in the market today. So there is slowing bank activity in aggregate, and it isn't catastrophically slow, but it is slower than pre-pandemic. And we think of banks... You know, um, one of the processes that they do is they're a wonderful way that um, businesses can connect to financing options to build stuff. They're a great driver of economic growth in the economy, even in their in their capacity um, as an intermediary. And we've seen um, since sort of that March Silicon Valley Bank crisis, the early part of last this year, um, we've seen a lot of bank lenders were saying, we're going to be more conservative about issuing loans. And then they kind of did so. And that's the interesting thing. I know, Aaron, this is interesting. Get back to this and now and now and now and now help relegate that with CapEx. Are they reducing CapEx because corporate cash is high? Reducing cap it's interesting. We'll talk about that. Aaron's right, corporate cash is over four trillion. Firepower, but nobody says you have to use it. And we had firepower in the depression, but it was a depression because no one was, was, was using it. Um, and if people hoard things like gold and silver, it's worthless to me and you and the economy. So make no loans about slowing bank activity is really interesting. So when we look at these things and we say, you know, you know, the bank loans in aggregate are decreasing in value. To Aaron's point, he's like, well, corporates have a lot of cash. They may not need bank loans. Corporate had a lot of cash a year ago, though. Um, a lot of bank activity is, is bank driven, not corporation driven. Banks are not at a loss for applications and speaking at least anecdotally from the 30 or so lenders um, that I got to speak to fairly recently. It's a matter of the nature of how that loans are delivered and the credit quality of those loans inherently. And that's, that's very interesting. So they're being more careful about issuing loans and this is turning off those spigots of investment. And so you're seeing some of those domestic um, investment spigots being held, yeah. Domestic deposits by corporations, individuals, banking systems are $17 trillion. Ooh, big money. Next on this, data releases. So here's some positive signs. This is a whole bunch of data that came out um, just in the last week across the board from economic and housing data. Uh, red means disappointing, green means better than expected. So in this essence, we saw a lot of things that were better than expected in green. Um, but a mixed bag, some things, we saw some manufacturing, industrial production, capacity utilization, all drop below to where we expected them to be. Uh, small business optimism hasn't been particularly shiny. It dropped 0.1. And CPI um, uh, month to month was also a little higher, uh, even though we expected that to be flat. Uh, but looking at mortgage applications, we saw a 7% rise. That's a good sign to the sign that we mentioned earlier that to the, to the tune of pent up demand. And I think we're going to see some more of that in the future, especially as we approach next summer. Um, mortgages will be on the increase, especially as some of these uh, historic low inventories followed by historic high mortgage rates ease a little bit. So in thinking about other things, some notes on inflation, we had year-on-year -year CPI fell to 3.1% in November. That's good. Still looking at inflation in services. Goods inflation has turned to deflation, which we kind of talked about last month. Wage growth continues to slow. And this does put a cap on service sector inflation. So the forward bond markets are predicting a slow but steady decline in Fed rates starting next year. And this is the really interesting thing. This is what we we're talking about before. So the Fed was like, we can envision three rate cuts. And that would bring rates down, you know, 0.75% on the short term. Pretty good. But the market's pay pricing it. And the bond market going forward, they're full of shenanigans, those bond traders. You know, they were they they uh, anticipated a pivot actually in 2023. If we go back a year, 
but they're anticipating like six or seven cuts going forward, which seems a bit optimistic, unless or pessimistic. Um, if we saw some really bad news about the economy, um, the Fed is also communicating very directly that they'll respond with lower rates. And I think they would respond aggressively to lower rates in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about before. What do you think, Colin? <laughs> Are things usually better or worse in election years? Oh, man, I had a, my... Ah oh, man, I feel like that's a huge question going into this specific election year. <laughs> that's a better or worse is a great question. I have a friend, um, one of my friends I went to high school with ended up um, uh, getting a PhD from MIT, and he does research, poli sci research around election economies. Uh -huh. um, and let me see if I can dig into his research. I gotta invite him to these things because I'll have some. He'd have some things to say. That's a really good question. Does anybody have an article about that that they want to share? Uh, while I look up some, um, let me look at some literature on this. So let's take a look at this question. Election, election year. Hmm. We know that the voters respond to the election year economy well. And, and when we think about this, wow, interesting. But how did that, the economy behave during these years? The contingency is so high and multivariate. I would question the stability of data. Aaron's always a reviewer too, and I appreciate that. Aaron, even the premise of your question is not something worth investigating. Not worthy of the journal, De Los Reyes. Not worthy. I love it. I'm a brutal realist. I love it. I love it. I love <laughs> I love it. You write, you write like my colleagues, and I appreciate it, Aaron. I, I really do. <laughs> This question isn't relevant for us. I know it's like we're all a bunch of nihilists sitting in front of our economic papers talking about this. Any data you find is arbitrary and not variable. That's really interesting. But um, bump, I like it. <laughs> so I know there was though there was a very interesting thing: uh, market returns on election years. And let me find that article for you. There we go. And now we're still in election years. This is really interesting. In non-election years, this is really interesting. Um, let's see what Zach's article is here, and I'll post this for you guys. Zach's is a nice little source for data. Um, I'll post this in here. This might, this is just one article on this question. Um, uh, and Zach's is, you know, they have a mixed bag in resulting these things. So looking at this without double checking their data, um, and this was an article that just came out. Uh, from 1937 to 2022, they argue the S&P in non-election years uh, rose about 12.5%. In election years, the return has been more like 9.9%, uh, which is uh, citing research by Janus in this category. Um, and I remember something like that as well. But to the point of error, there's a lot of individualized characteristics. Every economy is 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 can be quite different, even if they echo. Uh, Patrice uh, the markets usually see a relative soar because politicians are focusing on election rather than legislating, resulting in optimism about no new regulations. That's very interesting. So this is interesting. So there's ways to look at this, certainly from alternative points of view. Um, <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> oh, I love, I love this crowd. You guys are so fun. Aaron points out beach bird flight patterns during election years. My stats professor crushing us on correlation. You're right. Correlation, causation, often very different things, very tough to identify uh, within uh, the nature of this field. I will say this. So what do we expect so far can be can be questionable. And we can also look at the, the nature of uh, there. There is certainly a lot of trades investors make depending on what they anticipate laws and regulations might be. Right now, it's very noisy. Not only do you have you have a close election in terms of potentially the candidates involved, but uh, there's uncertainty, certainly whether Congress itself uh, is a majority of one party or another is an important characteristic to decide what, if any, significant changes get done. And so it is a very interesting thing. So keep an eye open in it. I guess we'll have probably a big discussion throughout 2024 on how this evolves, especially on the election side. So Colin, no good answers other than other than slightly meh returns for the S&P 500 in aggregate. But to Patrice's point, there are many instances where somebody might look at it. Someone should start an election coin crypto. <laughs> Oh, I love it. He's just, right? He's just, Aaron's just, he's, <laughs> I want a podcast where, you know, I just, you know, hit middle of the road economics topics and Aaron just hilariously, you know, 
tears them down. I think that'd be great. All right, so let's think about this. So when will things be on the uptick again? <laughs> Flip you for it, <laughs> Scott. Uh, when will things be back on the uptick again? Great question. So in here, um, we have a few things that beg pause, but also cause hope. And so this was a question that we had from uh, some of the Albert's List community earlier on. And so I want to kind of address this, take a look at this and see what we can do with this. So we look at delinquency rates on credit card loans. Now, that's an interesting thing. Credit card loans are uh, often the most expensive part of consumer debt, even not necessarily the biggest portion. In aggregate, if we divide that aggregate household debt by all the households, that's something like $6,000 of credit card debt that might be revolving. So it's not nothing to sneeze at for the average American household. We know that delinquency rates in general um, have been lower compared to long-term averages, particularly before the 2008 recession, 2009, 2008, 2009 recession. To the tune though, they are going up. The delinquency rates are increasing. And <laughs> I don't disagree with your grad econometric. I've taken many grad econometrics, Aaron, and it also makes me equally cynical about all things. So it's delightful. And you know, at the end of the day, when you publish for a living and you go for this and you have to make that sacrifice and say, I'm aware of its flaws. And basically, you're, at this point, most of my articles are pleading with editors and saying, hey, you know, I did an instrumental variable test on this and I did this on this. Uh, variable is good enough. You know, even though, you know, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting discussion. So when we rock and roll with this, we have delinquency rate and credit cards increasing. Look at that far corner of that chart, still below long-term averages, but also increasing. Um, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing. We usually see at the start of a true growth period in the economy. So thinking of the early 90s, thinking of the early 2000s, thinking of 2010, even 2011, we start seeing decreases in uh, delinquency rates on things like credit cards. And that happens pretty continuously. People are in a better financial position. They're able to get ahead of their credit card payments and they suddenly get to a level where they can start paying these back. We have not reached that position yet, which is interesting. We're still in a declining credit quality environment, in which case maybe we're more like, like 1996 or seven, or maybe it'll level off like it did in the late 90s, or maybe it will turn a corner and start decreasing again. I'm looking for that a strong, robust consumer signal that people, despite wages increasing faster than inflation, people are able to get ahead of their debt in a more meaningful way. That would be nice to see. So that's what I'm looking for, number one, consumer side. Number two, we can look at other things. And this is back to the discussion that Aaron you ran into. If you entered the conversation later, we were talking about um, corporations and CapEx. And I was relating a story that um, uh, I was talking to a friend who's uh, in the financial industry. And, you know, he analyzes a lot of firms. And he's saying right now, he's noticed, I said, one characteristic that he's noticed is that a lot of firms have dropped off in their CapEx expenditures. And in other words, that, that when they look for capital expenditures, things like property, plant, equipment, that's often an engine for future growth. It's saying expansion will happen. Here's our CapEx and let's make it happen. Now, Aaron brings up a few variables here. He says that, hey, we're sitting, corporations are sitting on a huge amount of cash. Uh, CapEx probably looks different for them that way. They're still utilizing that maybe in the future, but right now they're not using it in the traditional means of, of CapEx. They're waiting. And they might be waiting for a better system or to be assuredly on this, assuredly in a better economic state. Uh, but right now they are waiting. And if we look at CapEx expenditures and transactions and then divide it by GDP, you know, we do know that CapEx has been trailing a little bit. And although it did increase after the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it hasn't been going up meaningfully. And it'd be nice to see corporations do, um, in addition to the aggregate investment numbers, start looking at those CapEx numbers increasing, start looking at channeling the excess cash reserves into places that generate growth for the future, which is what be, would be really, really nice to see. I'm waiting for those things. Now, is the economy doing terribly? No. Here's why. One of the things I was really worried about last time, let's look at holiday spending. Now we have some holiday spending data coming through the door. And this is data from uh, BAC, um, but we've got some credit card spending data in 2023 in the green line. Um, holiday items also 2023. We're tracking pretty close to where we were in 2022. Uh, October, November numbers were higher. December looks like it might round 
the value at about where we were in 2022, 2021. Sort of the essence of this argument was that engaging the holiday spending debate and anticipating it might be less than usual. So far, based on my perception of it, holiday spending data has been better than we had initially thought it could be. And that's very good. Now, I can't relegate that with the retail spending data. It just means that people are spending it and maybe things like experiences over things like retail, spending on other things that still yet help the economy. Aaron says, and this is interesting too, massive consumer surplus. It looks like credit and card spending are not really growing. What is interesting is that there's not major holiday products this year, massive tech, toys, et cetera. Holiday travel, phones, watches, games, consumer surplus has brought forward from 2024, 26 because of COVID and post COVID bubble. We're in a flat valley of consumer surplus. That's probably true. I think we are in a, we are in a situation where consumer surplus, we are seeing it. It is very much a valley. So there's nothing extraordinary about the product mix to Aaron's point to suggest that holiday spending will ramp up. But to that point, you know, holiday travel has been robust and other aspects have been robust. And that's been nice to see. Um, we, we haven't hit those 2021, you know, pandemic highs of staying at home and spending, you know, tons of money. And we'll see how the holiday season rounds up. But we should end up in pretty good, uh, a pretty good season, which bodes well over the economy. Now, also to Aaron's point, let's think about this. Let's think about the share of discretionary spending. Uh, per household um, by income percentage. And so one fear that we had is looking at things like if you earn, um, if you, uh, the duality of the economy right now, meaning that people who are more comfortable and earn more money, um, they've been able to spend, uh, but we're worried about the consumer stress, particularly around people in the lower end of the, of the income spectrum. And at least looking at uh, 2019 through 2023 data, while 2023 has not been a stellar growth year across the board, you notice that from 2022 to 2023, discretionary spending increased across all income levels on the left-hand chart, that yellow line to that ye yellow graph to that, to that uh, green graph. And then we look at ratio of credit card spending um, to debit card spending per HA by income group. And a lot of this depends on certain variables. This is often a useful indicator, but it's not always the best indicator. Um, we don't see an increased reliance on credit cards, but I think that's a double-edged sword. A lot of people uh, who have the ability to use credit cards and credit cards can offer very... Uh, um, not only do they have sometimes beneficial or superior security benefits to using credit cards um, as opposed to debit cards for some transactions, uh, but they also have some um, obviously reward points, particularly for those people who are able to pay them back quickly. Um, so it's a noisy indicator is what I'm saying. People who might be more financially literate might be using uh, credit cards in different ways that they can pay them back in different aspects. So I think that's an interesting thing. That's right. That's really interesting you point that out, Aaron. You know, I I distribute gifts. I have a staff and I have all these people at and the at UNM that I like to buy gifts for and I buy them things and gift cards. And in return, I've received more dining, uh, uh to your point, dining cards than I've ever had before. Like, go out and eat at a restaurant, Riley. Riley needs food. I don't need food, but it's like one of those things. It was very amusing to me. Um, and uh and I gave them in return. Uh I had an AI generated holiday card. Uh, where I generated a family of French Canadian fur trappers and then photoshopped my family on them. Um, it was very amusing for me and uh, very tolerant of my wife to accept that. But um, one of the things that we have to do, uh, shift the subscription economy drops consumer buying patterns. Now, this is interesting, Aaron, because you're looking at this, especially on the consumer side for things like this. That's a worthy discussion. We could go a deep dive into that in a future month. Buying, um, you know, uh, all of these big ticket items versus that gradual income stream model that we've seen across the board. Oh, Albert says uh, Wall Street bankers see lower bonuses this year, so that might take a hit here too. I've got. A, I was talking to another friend in the industry this morning. He's expecting a significantly lower bonus, and you know, you're like poo poo, tiny fiddle for the bankers, but interestingly, it's amazing how much of those luxury market. Uh, um, uh, areas and everything from vacations to watches are often highly dependent on some of the consumer behavior of, uh, of very wealthy bonuses in certain parts of New York. But, but it's amazing to see how this translates in the rest of the system. So I guess the good news is so far in Exhibit 5 and 6, uh, concerns that people have in aggregate about the way that people have been spending on credit cards just don't appear immediately from the data. 
but it doesn't mean that it isn't getting worse or better. And I think in aggregate, um, not only are we do we have um, uh, higher delinquency rates, but um, you know we do have concerns going forward involving um, you know the excess consumer surplus that we've seen, excess savings being spent down, and the way that consumers will behave. But if we can combat that, and that's the window of opportunity. If the Fed, if this, if this is indeed going to be a soft landing, and this is a, another question that we have to address now, um, how do we translate the soft landing into a period of growth? And I think an engine of growth, you need a few things. You need to boost those wages above, um, um, above the inflation rate. You also have to, to make people have more money to throw around. You have to start lowering that rate from the Fed side, and you have to do it in a way that keeps inflation low. And so they're going to thread another needle with these rate cuts that hopes that the specter of inflation will not crawl back into this situation. Dun, dun, dun. Do you think, this is really interesting. So I had this question too. This is another question that we had from Albert's list. Do you think, how do you think the central bank interest rates are going to affect the economy, inflation, and job markets in the next two to three years? And so that's why I was prefacing this with all of these other things. Because look at this bond market right now. So this is our Fed funds rate. It went, they shot higher in, in the highest uh, growth that we've seen in the discount rate in 40 years. And then it's leveled off. Hooray. And are they going to increase? No, no, wait. Uh, Jerome Powell comes in and says, hey, you know, we expect rates to drop maybe 0.75% in the next year. Great. Uh, the market implied rates, if we go to the bond market, they're looking at not only one, two, three, four, five, six different cuts coming forward in uh, the next year or so. So whether each one of these is true or not, it would be nice to see because that does help corporations align for their future predictions where rates will be. One of the big overarching questions is, and this is often a generational disagreement between uh, very smart finance and econo economics people. So on one hand, you've got people who argue that say, hey, these short-term rates at 5%, the long-term, they have they were at 5% back in the 90s and before then, and, and this is the normal rate for the economy. They view the very low interest rate economy that we've had in this you know, intervening period in the in the aughts to uh, 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 2020, uh, 2021, I should say, uh, 2022, really, um, that 15 or so year period as being an extraordinary time of low rates, and that it's unlikely that we'll see something like that again. On the other hand, you have a lot of younger economists or younger finance folks who've not been around and not seen the recessions a lot. And they say, well, wait a second, because debt economies or late debt laden economies um, are so um, are are and we become so accustomed to the use of debt. Uh, there's a lot of systems in place that suggest that the economy should try at least to minimize um, <laughs> to minimize these these debt return rates or keep rates low over the long run, I should say, and that it's possibly likely that we'll be trending towards zero uh, um, again at some point in the future. And so a lot of the bets that we have as to whether what's going to happen in the economy in the next two or three years is whether you're in camp A that looks at, hey, 5% is the new normal, or we're going to gradually go back to 0%. And that dictates a lot of things. I think with the Fed saying that they're going to start cutting rates, and I think they will start cutting rates, I think that will benefit the economy. And we're going to thread another needle here. The first needle was whether we could control inflation without sinking the economy. So far, we're almost there. We just have to patrol it. Now, if we lower interest rates, we suddenly push money back into a place where they can go to investment purposes. And if corporations invest a bit more, then they start hiring a bit more. You've got a stronger job market and a potential uh, a bull market again in the future, which would be delightful for everybody involved. And this would be really, really interesting. So Aaron says, this is really interesting too. I want to go back here too. California dependency and stock events. The economy is going to rip the first 100th microseconds after the first rate cut. Uh, IT of massive uh, tech 10,000 global S&P 500 tech jobs are going to rip as everyone pumps AI into everything if it needs it or not. I actually do believe that one of the joys of AI is, where the hope of AI is, you know, to grow an economy, you need population growth or you need... Um, um, and slash, or you need some increase in um, the amount of um, stuff that people are able to produce. And one of the ways to do that is to make people more efficient at doing things. And AI is one of those things that has the potential to do that, which is really interesting, not least because it was able to generate my holiday cards. Um, Brett says, yeah, regular, it regu uh, seems to be a regular yearly thing for people. Albert says, companies keep cutting out here. That is true. Aaron says, rates will fall 
the 2.5%. So Aaron, Aaron's going for like a long haul. So if that's the case, so if Aaron's premise is good, and I like the idea of rates falling to two and a half percent, and that's certainly where the Fed is looking in the future when it relates to other things, is seeing that potentially down there. That's a very steady decrease of rates. We have no prior um, situation where that's actually happened in a modern economy, uh, where we've actually been able to reduce rates gradually. Normally, we hit a recession and we cut rapidly, but by reducing rates gradually, in the modern sense, we haven't seen, uh, but it would benefit us in the long run. It would generate a lot of potential power. The problem is when Fed rate cuts become too predictable, investors start making or delaying plans for investment depending on the predictableness of those rates. So if I have a choice and I think the rates are going to be 2% lower next year and it's not going to be a recession, I'm going to do a lot of things differently in the way that I invest my money. And so one of the things that will be important in this discussion is whether or not this is going to happen or not um, and whether the Fed can continue to do so and keep us out of a recession. If it's able to do so, to Aaron's point, it will start improving drastically. I'm not quite ready to argue for a rip economy, but I think that uh, uh, the ingredients are there. If the Fed communicates this and we're able to stay out of a recession, I see I see a potential for a uh, extended period of growth in the future. But it will depend on, I got to see an improvement in um, those delinquency rates and improvement in, in corporate expenditures. So that's the good sign. So put it all together. Is this what a soft landing looks like? Sure, it looks like maybe. So here's a bunch of indicators to determine whether the economy is in a recession. And no matter what your crazy uncle said at Thanksgiving, uh, we're not actually in a recession. Um, a lot of people have different views on the economy. Certainly it could be stronger. It's not even by any means. There's a lot of issues with the economy, but we're not in, an, in a recession. And going back in time, back to 2021 through 2020, almost 2024, we can see that things like non-farm payrolls are reaching a limit there. They, they're growing, but not as fast. But all these numbers, most of them are generally better than where we were at the beginning of 2021. All of this is growth from GDP to uh, GDO, which is the average of GDP and GDI, real personal income and transfers, even industrial production, while not up by stellar amounts is still higher. Um, the one that's been really disappointing has been real manufacturing and trade sales, but they're deal they were dealing with a super strong US dollar among other things uh, that kept this in this spot. Um, but um, everything else, household employment, real consumption in particular, have shown drastic improvements. And so while the improvements are slowing, they're still pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. All right. So that's what I'm looking for. Now, on cuts and yield curves, current treasury yield curve. This has been really fun. I grabbed this chart yesterday, so slightly stale. But current yield curve is downwardly sloping. Hopefully, this will be the only downwardly sloping yield curve that doesn't predict a recession. Sometimes yield curves predict recessions for all the wrong reasons. We had an inverted yield curve in 2019 and late 2019. That suggests when the yield curve is inverted and it's downwardly sloping, that does suggest a recession is imminent at least in the last seven times. And it was right in 2019. Did it predict COVID? Was the yield curve so, did the wonderful bond traders have knowledge about COVID before it happened in the recession that it would have? No, of course not. Uh, it was right, I think, by luck in 2020. And the question is, is can we get out of this? Can we try to lower this yield curve? So the current yield curve is the blue line. December 2021, we had what's called a normal upwardly sloping yield curve, uh, which is gray. And that's what we'd expect to see in a growing economy. We have this uh, downward sloping yield curve. And typically we think because um, what this does is imply that future rates have to go down. And as a consequence, if rates go down, typically they've gone down in recessions. But we know that rates are going to go down in a non-recessionary way, at least from the Fed. Our hope is that the Fed is right about the current economic state, that they can ease off uh, a little bit on rates. Uh, and perhaps we can get to a position where the yield curve equalizes. Long-term rates go up and down typically more slowly than short-term rates. So when the Fed starts cutting the short-term rate, we expect the long-term tail to kind of to kind of stay a little bit more stable, even as this kind of goes up and down. But the problem is with this is that what happens is, especially as we saw last week, those midterm 10-year bonds in particular drop precipitously um, in response to the Fed's announcement. And so in some senses, we might be chasing kind of this. Uh, downward sloping yield curve, at least um, throughout next year and the year after, um, you know, as short term rates uh, still lay ahead of long term rates and the Fed communicates their intention is to reduce rates. And this will produce some interesting effects, I think, in the bond market. But it's an interesting note. It'd be nice to have this purely as a case study going forward. 
<laughs> you know, this is right. That's why we are here. You're absolutely right, Aaron. It's great. We're in a recession. I'm like, with what data? I'm interested in you telling me it's a recession, but with what data do you have? Anyway, this is what I deal with. What are the same days? So what are some ways? All right, let me go back a sec. We're going to change horses a little bit. So get off your, um, you know, get off your, I don't know what, I don't know what's it, your Appaloosa and hop on, you know, uh, Shetland pony uh, and we'll figure, <laughs> I don't have a lot of horse vocabulary. Uh, what are the ways a candidate can stand out, especially with the job market today? So this is really interesting. And this is a question. I know you're Albert's list and you're looking at, what do you think about the job market? And, what does Riley know? He's an academic. Well, I do have a staff and I was a banker before this and I hire a lot of people and occasionally fire some people, but most of the time, very rarely and usually very nicely. Uh, so uh, different philosophies. So I'm going to go back here and we're going to discuss a few non-economic things. And there's a few of these things I want to go over, but I want to get on at least a pedestal while standing on my Shetland pony, which is very small. And I want to talk to you about a few things. So there's a couple of things. The jobs I've had that have been meaningful in my life, I have acquired and somebody has in the hiring committee has said, I hired you because of your cover letter. And imagine this. Now, a lot of people hate cover letters. 50% of people don't read them or something. It's a complete mixed bag. It's a coin flip. But you know, if you're looking to get a job in this market, spend time on cover letters. Because in my experience in reading cover letters and writing my own, most people don't know how to write a cover letter. Your cover letter, and I want to go over a few big points here with you because I want to take this opportunity, step outside the box of like economics and finance and just think big picture hiring. And that's one of the reasons why you're here. Cover letters are not there for you to rehash your resume. I can read immediately what's on your resume in a short amount of time. I know you went to this school, you got this GPA, these are your favorite colors, and this is the job you had for the last 15 years. Great. Why are you in this industry and who are you? That's what a cover letter can do. And this is really hard in hyper-competitive markets because you're always worried about exposing any vulnerability about you. But I'm going to point out a couple of things that I truly believe that I think you should take into account here. Number one, you know, the things that you perceive as your weaknesses aren't really your weaknesses. Your strengths are actually where your weaknesses will ultimately derive from because you're careless about them. When you, when you turn a weakness, though, something that you're worried about, a vulnerability, ability into something that you can use and own, it becomes an asset that you possess. One of your assets might be the story of how you ended up in this role anyway. How do I distinguish you from 2,000 other people or 100 other people? I just did a resume. I just did a, a, a hire on, on, we had like 100 applicants for a position. And imagine distinguishing yourself in this role. And there's worse roles out there that do this. And you look at these things and you're asking yourself as the hiring manager, who is this person? What makes them tick? How do they roll? And how do they work with people? And that's what interests me about, about you as an individual in the marketplace that I would potentially hire. Cover letters can be things. Why are you in this industry? A story that you tell, something that gives you passion and that you're fascinated about. You know, whether it's a race you won or I had um, someone who was a chess champion in um, uh, where they came from in a, a different nation. And you had all of these other aspects that they weaved into this letter that allowed me not only to remember them, but to put context into the type of person that I thought they were. Take time on your cover letters and don't BS us and don't have AI write it for you. Personal experiences are great. Do it and don't. I'm going to drop the mic there. Just spend time on your cover letter and stop you know, dilly-dallying about it. Internal referrals. Yes, Albert is an excellent individual who values individual commentary. I know, uh, chat GPT, you can try it. Maybe they can help a little bit, but it will, we'll probably know. Internal referrals. Uh, gosh, great way to, another second thing, right? So another way to look at the job market this way, and I got to tell you, it's a real deal. If somebody knows you inside that's like two levels up from where you'd otherwise be. Random person on the street. Networking, networking, that's been said a hundred times. Skill specialization and continuous learning. Either be super specialized and be super specialized and show that you learn other things that no one has. Soft skills, your ability to have a communi communicate, to engage other people. All of that stuff is valuable. Are you charismatic on this, on this way? And if you're not charismatic, are you at least polite and engaging in a way that reflects these things? Do you come prepared with good questions to things like interviews? And there's no surefire answer for any single person. Own what you do best and get a few honest friends to give you good feedback. 
Bada bum. Call it. No, I just also wanted to chime in. Like we recently got a clearly AI assisted uh, cover letter at my work and my boss was like, has anyone seen both of these guys in the same room? Because it looked so similar to each other. Ah, <laughs> that's really funny. How bad? That's really good. That's yeah. that's good. They were like the same the same cover letter. It's great when you share cover letters with your friends. That's really that means another thing. You're not doing it right. I need a personalized story. Everyone's <laughs> got one. You didn't just you didn't you weren't just you didn't you know Chat GPT didn't just create you yet out of out of thin air. And you arrived at some spot after 25 or 35 or 45 years or whatever it was you were doing. There's a reason you're there. And don't worry about it. I'm interested in reading your story. Um, Albert says, do you think the advice that the UNM Career Center offers aligns with what you see in the real world? <laughs> Man, I have to, I, I like that this is an administrative test that you're going to promptly put on YouTube. I will defer that information other than I will say UNM Career Center offers excellent advice for our would-be graduates um, that are looking out in the field for potential opportunities that are job, that are job searching. And we got to meet people from where they are. But also to that sense, though, for those who, is, who are seasoned out there in the marketplace, if you've been in school for a while, not been in school, you're thinking about going back to school, you know, and if you're looking at this list saying, oh, Riley, what does he know? Don't do it. I mean, I would really think, I mean, I mean, really, <laughs> and if you are looking for a job, uh, I'd still try taking a little bit of this advice. But hey, that's me and I'm here for you. And you, either way, and I, I'm rooting for you wherever you are in your ability to get these jobs. So, And because you showed up tonight and are here and rocking and rolling, I'm grateful for you being here, certainly. But these are things you got to think about and things that matter. And and this is a bottom, bottom line thing that you'll have to do. Although it is, and this is an aggregate, right? Aggregates look good. It doesn't mean your industry is good. It doesn't mean your ability to find a job is necessarily good. We can have uh, a, a town or citywide recessions while the economy is doing quite well. But when we think about things like unemployed persons for job opening, it is starting to go back up again, meaning that there's uh, fewer um, unemployed people per job opening. We've been at this historic low now, and we're starting to see that reach a more healthy level. It's not unhealthy by any means, um, but it is starting to go up or tick up a little bit as those openings drop down and the unemployment levels remain more or less the same. So it is going to be a situation where even if you're not in a more competitive market right now, I view it as being continuously competitive um, as we go down the next few years. And just don't lose hope and keep doing it. And remember that if everybody feels, you know, do these things, if it's not working one way, try another one. I'm having a heck of a time trying to get one of my students an internship right now in the financial services sector. He's super great, super brilliant, but he's been it's been hard to find um, internships that take him. So please consider it. And I appreciate your advice. Oh, thank you, Angela. Pretty solid. I appreciate it. But keep an eye on this and do the best you can in the future. Don't be afraid of owning your vulnerabilities of who you are as a person, as a way to tell people what you are and what you are about. You're not a name on a page. You're somebody. And that's important for the comp company to know. And the worst case is I haven't read actually a cover letter that reflected a personal story that I was like, I don't like this person. It actually endeared me to that person, whatever it was. Um, since job satisfaction, let's talk about this. Are you happy with your jobs? <laughs> maybe you are, maybe you're not. Maybe you're on Albert's list saying, I need a job somewhere else. Since job satisfaction reached its nadir after the Great Recession, ah, 2010, remember those days? We all hated our jobs then. 42.6% only liked their job. Worker satisfaction in general has actually risen during that time period. You might never guess this, but even if you would guess the COVID-19 pandemic didn't happen, we're now at a higher level of satisfaction in our jobs in general than we were back in 1987. Not too shabby, huh? Mm, pretty good. Another thing to think about. Oh, yeah, now we're going to real estate now. This is the last on the job slides, and then we got some more things. But um, to kind of close it up with some other data today, um, other things to think about. Premium discount in buying a home versus renting it. Oh, my goodness gracious. The uh, premium for buying a home is now at the highest level over renting it that we've seen on record. And this is really interesting to find out. So, again, to a lot of Aaron's point, too, a lot of people do indeed who might be looking for homes are looking for, uh, uh, have them already. But some of our ongoing frustrations that it's just so expensive to buy even relative to renting, evidenced in places like this. 
Good time to buy uh, anytime we're below water on renting uh, from the uh, 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 end of the Great Recession all the way through to about 2020. I remember I bought a house back in 2013, and man, that was a deal when I reflect on it back then, 2014. It was like right here. And then um, I ended up buying a house again in 2021. 2020, no, 2020, it was December, 2020. And, you know, it was right before asset prices really shot up through the roof. So I lucked out in a couple places, but timing isn't everything. So do, this is, this is probably uh, unsustainable in the long run. It doesn't mean that prices are going to crash or rents are going to increase drastically, but we will probably see some price adjustments in the next couple of years, like the ones we've been seeing now. Mortgage rates. This is what Albert was going on about earlier today. Look at these mortgage rates dropping. Have we gotten the worst behind us? I hope so, particularly since the Fed is signaling for lower um, lower rates. And I think the Fed also, and the motivation in, in Jay Powell's mind, I think he wants mortgage rates to be lower. He wants more sales to happen. He wants more inventory churn so prices adjust. And so I think with all those things in mind, this drop we've seen from eight to six to the sixes in mortgage rates, the primary mortgage rates, should continue to fall a little bit in the future. Albert says, I want my 2.5% rate back. <laughs> I'm holding on to mine for the dear end of time. And when I, if I move out of Santa Fe or anything, I'll be like, hey, who wants to rent a house in Santa Fe? It's very nice. It's enchanted with Riley magic. It's one of those things. I'll try to sell it to somebody. You can rent it for me. We'll triple net you. It'll be great for me. No, it'll be great. I'll, <laughs> I'll just do it. I'll hire a bunch of uh, something will break and I'll mysteriously disappear like any good landlord. And then I'll increase your rent 28% next year. Aaron says the 15-year mortgage is the key product. This will rip lower next year, under 4% in 2025. I like this. Rip and lower 15-year mortgages with Aaron. Yeah, 15-year mortgage. That's the 15-year mortgage rate. It's really fun. The secondary mortgage rate. As he points here, um, the 15 year is also on its way down and, and I suspect it will continue to drop. I think that'll look favorable for a lot of folks looking to buy homes. And hopefully we'll see some of that uptick in real estate happen as these mortgage rates drop. And that'll be good actually. More churn is good for the market as it stands right now. More people moving. It's impossible. It's very hard to hire out of state people sometimes. And I think some of that is because of the nature of mortgage rates as they stand right now. Not all of it, but some of it. So going down to our little local section here, we're talking a little bit about what's happening in San Francisco, and then let's talk about what's happening in San Jose. <laughs> and is it the same thing that's happening? <laughs> so, so let's take a look here and let's grab this thing. So, so October data was just released. Remember that local data trail, trails national data by about a month. So right now we look at the unemployment rate in the Bay Area ticking up slightly a few, an increase in the number of unemployed folks, not back to where we saw in August, which hit where we saw a lot of those layoffs that had happened over previous months uh, be recognized, but it's still trending at a higher rate than it has been. Back a year ago, we were looking at these really low 2%, 2.5% uh, unemployment rates. Unemployment has gone up substantially since that time period. Reflecting on year on year, you know, we look at individual hiring on the month. We saw some encouraging increases in trade transportation utilities, about almost 3,000 new jobs added in particular in the Bay Area. Um, business services um, have been choppy overall, but, and I was concerned somewhat after the 9,000 person fall we saw in September, that since rebounded another 5,000. That's a good sign because those are typically um, uh, high paying and necessary jobs that service a lot of aspects of the business economy. Education and health services, health services is a big chunk of this in this case, showing like it is in the rest of market an improvement in growth, looking at another other 7,000 people there. And we're not seeing widespread sector-wide job losses in any way, but we are seeing uh, growth being uneven in different sectors. And, I, and that is what you're feeling right now with the nature of the job market and as it stands. So in San Jose, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, we got some other things happening. Kind of the same thing overall, same overall trends. Um, uh, trade transportation utilities was more flat in this area. Information was up about 600 jobs, still not where we were in the summer for values, but only tracking a couple K behind. Uh, we are up 1% on the year in information, so that's good. 
Um, professional and business services also showed a little bit of a rebound after a drop. A lot more in health services, again, leisure and hospitality, basically flat with other services. And so overall, you see, you know, the kind of senses that you're seeing in the overall market, government hiring is happening to the tune of about three to 4,000 in each location. But we're seeing at least that the unemployment rate is not increasing meaningfully. I chopped this up in October to noise. In the November numbers should be pretty good, I'm hoping for, uh, at least in the Bay Area. And to this point, and let's talk, Aaron, a very local and pressing matter, state and local budgets are going to be a major problem in California. State deficits are massive. So in the sense, and this is the thing you got to watch for, that government employment side of things, um, think about 316,000 people in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, uh, as well as the North Bay, um, as well as 99, almost 100,000 uh, down by San Jose. And collectively, that you know that 400,000 people work in some form of government. It is a challenging road going forward. Governments are going to be struggling with things like the budget deficit um, being a big problem in the way that that trickles down, in the way that expenses are run, the way that activity happens, and the way that individual budgets might be stretched. Different cities have different markets. Some may focus heavily on property tax, some on sales tax. The good news is property tax, you know, although we're seeing some declines across the board, um, they shouldn't be too, they shouldn't be overly devastating for that portion of the tax base. But those uh, sales taxes, other revenues that might come through uh, also become important things to watch because those are economically dependent. So where it comes down to, especially on the job side, are that state allocation level and the nature of what people can do there. And so a lot of the stuff that's associated with um, the government could be um, looking at some potential risks, at least locally in the California economy next year, uh, once this stuff gets settled. What a ride. So it's been good. So it's okay anyway, this is really interesting. Normally, interestingly, government employment um, struggles in good times. Uh, it usually goes up in bad times um, for one reason that the jobs, there's less fluctuation in aggregate. If we look at the long run, less variability than private sector, they, uh, they fire less, but they also hire less. Um, but at the same time, you know, as the economy starts chugging along again, there'll be a lot more. Um, our hope is that that competition for those private sector and higher paying private sector firms, uh, might crowd out some of the government work and it'll be, a, it'll be a hard thing to do. And if anybody's hungry for using chat GPT, it's got to be government workers at this point. It's got to be tough. They're already overloaded with stuff to do. It's it's challenging. Oh, man. What a bright future. All right. 7, 13, and 13. That's what I got on deck today. Anybody have any questions? Thanks for sticking along. We acquired some additional people, it looks like. Thank you all for coming today. What do you have as questions? Anything else I can answer? Anything else you want to go over in our economic update today? Aaron, you're awesome like usual. <laughs> I love I love this audience. You guys are my some of my favorite human beings on the planet. I don't even, I mean, you know, one day we'll have to have an Albert's List party. Albert's gonna host something in the tenderloin. It'll be very it'll be, you know. Uh Albert says, when you go back to 2023, is the most significant thing you think that happened in the economy, hands down. From my finance economics perspective, our ability to keep the Silicon Valley banking crisis from being a national banking crisis was wonderful. And it, the banking industry, and let me reiterate this, they were freaked out. They said in March, and then I met with bankers in March, and then I met with them again in October, and we were having, I'm part of that, I do this discussion about the outlook and things. In March, they were terrified. Because not only were they underwater across the board on a huge number of these of these unrealized losses, they were deeply fearful of runs and other things. And when the Treasury opened up the capital markets or this capital line to them, it did save a lot of banks from going under. And it saved a lot of banks. And even that that sort of domino effect when one bank goes under, then another bank goes under. It, it really kept a regional banking crisis from being a national one. It kept us out of a, a recession, I, I believe it, in that sense. I mean, recessions can start for dumb reasons. That would be a dumb reason for sure, but it doesn't mean it's any less deadly. <laughs> You know, I'm juggling a handgun that's loaded or something. And it's one of those things. And a lot of banks were doing this. And the market was really, really concerned. So I'm very pleased that that was resolved. Hands down, that was the safest. Mm. That was the greatest thing to happen was us not having a severe national banking crisis. 
but a local one, which was still terrible. But it could have been worse. What do you guys think? What do you guys have? Call in. I guess, like, since this is the last one of the year, do we have any... Actually, no, the next one would be the last one of the year. I guess we would be doing a 22-3 end of year in uh, January. We get we get Dr. White's top 10 list in January. And then we'll <laughs> more predictions in February. Yeah, I get to be wrong again. This will be great. Because, uh, in a, in we still have way. left in the year. You know, banks could still fail. Uh, the market could completely tank. I don't know, right? Yeah. Well, we, we that... probably have higher odds of a Santa rally than anything else. Something that I was uh, reading about was that we're seeing the last boomers retire. Like they're they're leaving the job market, which represents a significant skill, I guess, loss. <laughs> or there's not going to be a transfer period, I assume. Um, so are there any comments on that? How would that affect the jobs market? How would that affect any specific industries? I guess since we're in Bay Area, yeah. how would that affect tech? How would that affect yeah. hospitality? How would that affect uh, anything specific you can think of? Mm. Um, how should job seekers prepare and whether or not, is this like an advantageous thing or a disadvantageous thing is I guess a good question to think about. I think it's an opportunity call. That's a really good question. So one good thing in aggregate. So if you look back in time, at sort of the workforce participation rate, as an example. We saw the participation rate, and that's the you know people of working age who are looking for jobs and working in the workforce, increase in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, women joined the workforce, but also we had boomers that were um, in aggregate, this big generation of working age folks that reached their peak around the year 2000. And then since then, we've seen participation rates drop, and that's a factor we're getting older, people are retiring. And we're gonna see the one, the first obvious factor here is that our, our with the boomers retiring, that does lower our participation rate. And it will because of the size of their generation, or just not being made up for in other generations that are coming online. And so as a consequence, as we, you know, we're worried about demographic crises in the long run across any global economy. We know we are getting older. There are difficult questions that we have to address involving the nature and sustainability of our ability to provide everything from Social Security to varying amounts of, of support for retirees as they approach this age. It does change few things. It is going to continue this process where we have a lot of older people who have the most demand on healthcare in the system. I'm very bullish about healthcare in the next 20 years because of this glut of folks that are around here. But we're seeing that right now. And the investment that's happening is towards healthcare and, and older folks and all the things that they need um, and in that age of being retirees. Now, as that frees up the market in one side, to your question, you're like, well, is this an opportunity? You're losing all those skills. That's absolutely true. There are skills, there are challenges, there are situations in place. The question is, is have we arrived at the policies, procedures, and actions that can allow us to approach um, and utilize the wisdom of prior generations in a way to handle crises that might be entirely novel in the future? And there's no, there's a mixed bag of answers to this. One is that by all means, it's not in itself a crisis of a lack of information, I think. I think every generation rises to the challenges that are present in them. And I think this generation, your generation, our generation's younger, generations older than me, all have the ability to take leadership roles in very meaningful ways that will continually improve. So I'm actually not worried about that. I think what we have to look in aggregate, though, that pendulum of, you know, that working age population being smaller than it was previously, how can we sustain certain things? How do we sustain long term growth? How do we sustain um, um, a, a debt load um, where we have every incentive to increase debt over the long run? And who do we burden when we do that? And where does that burden fall in the future? That's the question. And Aaron, uh, Aaron's got the good news here. Tech, health and housing are going to take off, says Aaron. It's like an Iceland earthquake getting ready to blow. And you're standing right there. In, uh, where is it? Grind, Grind, Grindavik. Right along the, <laughs> it's a horrible analogy. <laughs> it's like an Icelandic earthquake. There's gonna be a four kilometer long fissure that will open and spew out jobs, says Aaron. That's, <laughs> that's really, <laughs> That's really dark. I hope everybody's safe through this. Uh, if you if you're if you're dialing in from Iceland, I hope you. I hope it remains far away from the the town and habitable folks. Good question, though. 
what else have you guys got? Any other questions that we have for today? Yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. You know, this is the one time where you get to talk to a college professor <laughs> and you don't owe him any tuition I, afterwards. I have no tuition, no grades. It's completely non judgmental. Oh, yeah, now that you think about it, there's no grades either. So good work, Albert. Be minded. Yeah. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I want to thank everyone for joining. We'll be back in January with the full recap of what went on in 2023. And if you have any questions, you can always reach Dr. White at his website or on LinkedIn, and you can connect with him there. Uh, in the meantime, happy holidays. We've got one more event here this year with a resume review workshop coming up Thursday, and we hope that you'll join us for that, and you'll find that on our Eventbrite page. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, stay lucky out there, and have a great holiday season, and we'll chat with you all soon. Goodbye, everybody. Oh.